Well, good morning and welcome to church. It's so good to see you all here. And if you're joining us online, we're so happy to have you as well. We're going to start today's service by declaring our praise for our great God together. So please stand and join with us. Oh, praise in the valley, and I'll praise. 
God, we thank you that we can be here this morning. We thank you for the privilege it is that you have given us voices to sing and hearts to love you. Thank you that you've opened our hearts and that you welcome us in. We pray this morning, Lord, that we will know your presence here, that we will hear your word, and that we will draw closer to you and know you better and love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Say hello to the people around you and grab a seat. Welcome again to church. If I didn't get to say it the first time, if you weren't here the first time, uh, so good to have you here. Those conversations, we'd love for you to keep having those after church. We're going to have morning tea together. Um, but welcome. Uh, what a glorious day to have today um, and what a privilege it is to come together um, and share in Jesus and get to know him better. So I would love to also welcome people online because I always forget so if you are online today, we're really glad that you're joining us. Um, before we launch into all of my little advertisements, um, youth are going to head off. So you guys can grab your things. Bye. If you are new or visiting today, um, it's nice to meet you. My name is Ange. Uh, and if you are new or visiting, you may have got a contact card when you first walked in. Um, they're not up, but if you did get one, you can fill that out and hand that to me or one of the staff. We'd love to know a little bit more about what brought you to church today. Um, or you can jump online, you can do it online, um, and we'll get in touch with you and just let you know what we're on about here at Riverston. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we have a couple of things coming up. So next week, we have our New to Life, which is something we run every month. And it's for people that are new or feeling new, uh, that want to know a little bit more about what we're about here at Life Anglican. Um, and so we are having that here on Sunday at 12.15. So we'd love you to join us for lunch. Um, if that's something that interests you, come and let me know, or Melissa, or one of the staff. Um, we'd love to have you along for that. So that's next Sunday. Um, also next Sunday, is gate crash which is what we call our 5 p.m service for youth so we really want to encourage our youth to get settled in and get used to coming to church and so our 5 p.m service next sunday night um, is specifically geared towards them so if that is you or if you know someone who may enjoy that we'd love to see you at that service as well 
And then two weeks from now, um, we have our celebration salvation service. Now, the really, there's lots of really exciting things about that, but something you really need to take note of is there is only one service on that day. So, you all should be fine because you're 10 o'clock people and it's at 10 o'clock. So, just do what you normally do. But if you normally think you kind of chop and change and go to a few different services, there is only one service that day. So, Make sure you get here to get a seat. Um, we're going to be all in together to celebrate that day. And that's a day um, where people are baptised and confirmed um, and can publicly declare for the older ones, not the babies, but their parents will. Um, but we'll declare that um, their love for Jesus and their intent to follow him. I'm going to hand over to Miles. You're going to share some things with us. Cool. Thanks, Hange. Hey, everyone. Welcome again to church. This is the best place to be on a Sunday. So glad that you're here. Uh, today is Moore College Sunday. Uh, Moore College is a Bible college, which is in Newtown in the city. Uh, it's the Bible college that I studied at and that Dan did some study at as well. Uh, and it's a great place because what it does is it trains men and women to be equipped to go and share and teach the gospel of Jesus. Uh, in Sydney and in Australia and all around the world. Uh, there are lots of excellent Bible colleges around and Moore College is one of them. Uh, and so it's really good for us to talk about Moore College and it's really good for us to pray for Moore College. And so in a moment, Ben is going to come and he's going to lead us in prayer and he's going to pray for Moore College. Uh, but before he does, we're going to watch a short video um, just interviewing a student from Moore College and seeing what they're up to and what kinds of things happen at Moore College. We can watch the screen. My name is Rehan. Um, I'm the son of uh, two Sri Lankan parents. I was born in Australia, I'm married to Kartika, and we have a little seven month girl called Abigail, who is so much fun. Growing up, I heard the stories of the Bible, but I didn't really understand who Jesus is and what that kind of had to do with me. I joined a small group at uni and there wasn't anything amazing that happened, but we read the Bible and there were just a bunch of people who really loved me for who I was. And kind of as we look through the Bible, I started to reorient my life around Jesus and the Bible. Before college, I worked as a physio in a hospital. And then in my sort of third or fourth year of work, kind of was feeling overwhelmed by just, you know, how much time and energy and investment we put into people's lives to get them out of intensive care, back to the wards, back home. Then I really just wanted to tell people about Jesus, but I couldn't, limited by my work and my time. And my pastor offered me the opportunity to come along on staff as our youth pastor. And I think at the end of that process, just came to terms with just how, um, how important it is just to be uh, shaped by really good theological foundations and not just work of what I think is right, um, but have really good training in the Bible. I think what I've really appreciated about college is just slowing down, just hitting the pause button on full-time ministry for a bit and just being in community just to learn, to reflect, um, just to go really deep in the Bible and understand um, the Bible a lot better so I can be better equipped to teach the Bible better. Um, to figure out where my weaknesses are, figure out where the sinful areas are and have some really good time to work on them before heading back out into full-time ministry. After college, um, yeah, we're kind of exploring two things at the moment. Uh, one option I'm exploring is hospital chaplaincy. Um, just with my background working in a hospital and, you know, love for telling people about Jesus. That's one thing I'm exploring at the moment, but also keeping doors open for uh, parish ministry and working as a pastor. I think, um, yeah, working as a youth pastor gave me a really good taste of what it's, look, what it's like just to look after a small church. And uh, that's been a helpful experience. So we're kind of praying about those two things at the moment. All right, let's pray together. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Yours, we gladly say, are the heavens and the earth. You have made the sun and the stars, rivers and minerals, sand and silt and sky, and us. We are, you say, made in your image. Yours the kingdom, yours the power, 
yours the glory and us. Father, what are we to deserve that kind of honour? We who stutter over your name, we who can hardly make room for one hour in our weeks of work and distraction and anxiety for you, we who take our very lives from your hand and yet entertain our own self-madeness, what are we to deserve your likeness? We are poor governors of your universe that you have entrusted to us. We are made in your likeness, but we know that our lives do not match that likeness. So we give you our gratitude this morning for Jesus, who is God made like us. And we thank you that he, like us, was made lower than the angels. We thank you that, like us, he took a mortal body, that he tasted suffering and pain and death and finitude. And we thank you that unlike us, he was completely and perfectly in your likeness so that he not only tasted death but disempowered it. Jesus is worthy and we are not. But you love us all the same, despite our failings. And so you have not only made a way out of death for us, but you have also given us Jesus as our leader and our brother who walks this road alongside us. Father, match the likeness of Christ to our flimsy, failing lives. Give us your Spirit's gifts of betterness to match this divine ancestry of ours. Take our unworthy selves and let our lives be lived towards you in a way that is worthy so that people around us will notice and wonder, so that injustice may be undone and made fresh so that angels may be moved to praise you for what you have done in us and through us and for us. Father, we remember this morning Bible colleges in Sydney and around the world and the students and the faculty studying there. We pray for them as they devote time and care to their studies and as you prepare them to join the long line of preachers and prophets and poets and artists and dreamers and dissenters who have taken your speech into the world. Give them light. But also we pray give them discomfort and uncertainty as they ponder you in all of your unsettling fullness. Give them understanding, but give them humility as well. Teach them that you are not a God who can be reduced or contained. Much as we would like to take doctrine and grammar and certitude like hammer and nails and have you fixed to the floor, unmoving and predictable, we cannot do that. For those who are in the rarefied air of theology studies, for all your people, for us, prepare us every day to live as the bearers of your likeness. Give us your wisdom that ends conflict. Give us your compassion that brings peace. And give us love that overcomes. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus, our perfect King and our humble brother. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Yuska, and we are going to be reading the Bible together. Um, so please take out your Bible or your Bible app. Today we're going to be reading from Hebrews 2, verses 5 to 18, and we're reading from the NLT version today. If you are new today or you are new to reading the Bible, um, you can find the book of Hebrews today in the second half of the New Testament. So if you look at the table of contents, you should be able to see it there. Let's read. And furthermore, it is not angels who will control the future world we are talking about. For in one place the scriptures say, 
What are mere mortals that you should think about them? Or a son of man that you should care for him? Yet for a little while you made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them authority over all things. Now when it says all things, it means nothing is left out. But we have not yet seen all things put under their authority. What we do see is Jesus, who for a little while was given a position a little lower than the angels. And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. God for whom and through whom everything was made chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader, fit to bring them into their salvation. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father. This is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. For he said to God, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. He also said, I will put my trust in him. That is, I and the children God has given me. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the son also became flesh and blood. For only a human being could he die and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the son did not come to help the angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Thanks, Yuriska. Good job on that reading. It's, uh, it's a hard reading, that one. It's, it's not hard words. It's just um, strange sentence structures. Who's been watching the Olympics? Been watching the Olympics? It seems like it's, I don't know, it seems like people are confused whether we're allowed to be enthusiastic about the Olympics or not. Uh, when, when World Cup was happening, like, Matilda's stuff was everywhere, but right at the moment you go into the shops and it's not like Olympic fever anywhere. We went out with the kids trying to buy some green and gold stuff just for school and it was really hard to find. Uh, it seems like we're a little bit like, are we, are we in on this or are we not in for it? It's been great for our family because the kids four years ago you know, Olive was six and didn't really get it. She's now old enough to kind of get it. So we've been watching a little bit with the kids, which has been really fun. I um, really love the kind of the underdog stories and the stories of the amazing comebacks, the amazing, um, you know, the Matildas game against Zambia. I don't know if you saw that one. Pretty, pretty amazing. Like at the one hour mark, they were down two to five, which in soccer, it's pretty much done and dusted with a score like that. And they came back to win it, 6-5. Great. I mean, I only saw the second half, but that was the only bit worth seeing, I think. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, there's some great stories like that. This last week, um, there were some, some stories like that. I don't know if you ho heard the one about, like, the mixed double, doubles ping pong. North Korea came in, expect they were the lowest on the table, expected to be lowest. 16 of 16, they were. Surprised everyone in their first game played... Japan, which was number two, and won it. And that kind of already set the mark and played right through to the finals, played for the gold, just missed it and got the silver. But, um, you know, to have a story like that, first uh, medal for North Korea in eight years, pretty, pretty great. Um, the other one that's happened this week is the pistol shooting. I saw this. I saw this. I was just inquisitive. I saw in the list of things on, like, online, Pistol shooting. And I, you know, I was pretty hopeful for, like, gun slinging, like, fire off uh, a number of shots. It's, it's a very strange sport. This is, you can see, this is kind of the, the outfit. They're rigged up with all these kinds of, they've got the horse blinkers on and the, 
um, some sort of monocle there. Pretty crazy. Very weird. But then not, after, not long after I saw that, these stories started coming out. Uh, like this next one, she's been dubbed, she was dubbed like the coolest Olympian. You know, some people call her Robocop. Um, just this, you know, I don't know what the toy is. She a good luck charm she has hanging from her hip there and uh, her, her glasses. She was dubbed the coolest Olympian. That is until, I, you probably saw this one, but that is until this guy came out. <laughs> this guy from Turkey. Most countries sent their Olympians. This guy just sent one of their mafia men. <laughs> and he just came out, hand in pocket, fire his shots off, got silver. Just, what a great story. People like drawing anime pictures of him as a superhero. It's, it's great having those stories of kind of the unexpected, the surprising um, stories. But also at the Olympics, it's hard not to go past just the incredible feat of humanity that's happening there. Because um, the kids have a little Olympics coming up, we we're just looking at some of the, they haven't happened yet, but things like the long jump, the high jump, the world record, the world record long jump is like almost nine meters. Like that's crazy that a human being can jump that kind of distance. Um, high jump is almost two and a half meters. Um, pole vaulting is insane. Like the, the world record is over six meters. Like those guys could comfortably pole vault onto a second story balcony. Like, it, rather than having a spare key under the mat, they could just have the pole vault <laughs> there and just always leave the upstairs window open and they would be fine and they would know that they're the only ones that are going to get in that way. Just crazy um, human feet. And it, it, it addresses some of what we sometimes think about uh, humanity. It's amazing to marvel at the, the, um, the incredible humanity and the the lengths people can go to and what they can do. And it, it, it makes us think a little about um, our worldview on humanity. What is humans? And I think we land on kind of one or two places often. The, the secular, secular thinking on humanity is either at times we kind of go on this, we are the authors of our own destiny. Humans can, they're infinitely adaptable. We can do anything we set our minds to. It's just a matter of time. And, and so we, we kind of put humanity in this category of, of gods controlling our world around us. And there's a problem, I think, with that because we find the times where we don't control our world. There are moments, certainly, where we marvel at what humans can do, but it becomes incredibly jarring when we hit a space that we can't overcome. And maybe it is only a matter of time but we only have limited time here. And so if we want to ask the question about will humans overcome the problem of, of cancer, that's fine to ask that question, but that may not be a qu question that can be answered in our own time. And it seems like everything we overcome has another problem around the corner. And so we can't fit in the category of where, where many gods kind of controlling our world. The opposite thing we sometimes do is we diminish humanity down to just a, a creature. We're just another one of the creatures. We're a little bit more evolved, we're a little bit more intelligent, but really we're just a smarter version of other creatures around. And I think generally most people would be uncomfortable with that answer as well. That it raises all kinds of questions of morality. It asks all kinds of questions about the value of life, the value of humans, uh, what makes one human valuable over another human and those kinds of questions. Are we just slightly more intelligent, maybe much more intelligent creature? I think, I, I find that an unsatisfactory answer. I think the Bible gives us a, a much more profound answer to humanity. And this passage we just read in Hebrews does address some of that a view on humanity that I think is more robust, more profound than, um, than those other views. I would say, as we read that, if you found that kind of hard to follow the train of thought, uh, uh, you're in good company with that. It's a, it's a kind of weaving argument that the author there makes. When I was preparing and I kind of read through the passage, I was like, ah, oh, I need to 
read that again. I, di I didn't get that. I read it again, and then I was like, okay, concentrate. You've got to read this. It's quite complex. We're going to work our way through it. So I would encourage you to have Hebrews chapter 2 open, and we'll look at some of that. I think there's some really helpful things in there for us. And the picture is, the picture is Jesus' humanity. Uh, in fact, I think... Um, was it the uh, the NLT just titles the sex this section Jesus the man? That's the that's the sentence. He is the man. Uh, the picture is. I mean, we called the series Jesus is greater, and the message of Hebrews two is he's the greater human. And there's a picture of our humanity. There's a picture of his humanity, and there's a picture of what to make to do with some of those questions. Hebrews chapter one. If you're following along, last week we didn't spend long on this, but uh, the message at the end of Hebrews 1 is Jesus is greater than the angels. But then we got to Hebrews 2, and it's almost like the author says, well, but he became a human. How can he be greater than the angels if he became a human? And the message here is, uh, well, humans are created for glory. That's the picture, the biblical view of humanity. And the author here picks up on that, uh, quoting a psalm. The psalm is Psalm 8. And that psalm is referring to Genesis chapter 1, to the creation story. And, and essentially what the Hebrew, the writer to the Hebrews is drawing out is this amazement at humanity. An amazement, more specifically, at God's view of humanity. Listen to this. This is what he quotes. What are mere mortals that you should think about them? Or a son of man, referring to humans there, or a son of man that you should care for him. The author is mar marveling, amazed at God's view of humanity. Why would God, considering who he is and considering who we are, why would God even care about humanity at all? He goes on, yet for a little while you made them lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. So his second thing he's amazed at, first God cares for them, now he's, he's marveling at the fact that God uh, has created them for glory. He goes on. There's another thing he's amazed at. He says, you gave them authority over all things. The third thing is that God handed them authority. This is a picture. This is a biblical view of humanity. And you can think of it in two, two words. The first one is reflect. We're created to reflect God's glory. And the second one is reign. We're cre created to rule, sorry, rule. We're created to rule over God's world. Reflect and rule. This is a picture the Bible gives of humanity. Not that we're just another creature, but there's something significant. The Bible uses the language in Genesis, made in the image of God. There's a, that's an a incredibly um, important theological truth about the biblical view of humanity, that we are not just another creature, but there's something specific about the creation of humans that is both designed for relationship with God and to reflect God himself. We reflect God, but also we're being given a significant job, a job that no other creature has been given, a job to rule over God's world. Now, that means a couple of things. One is, if we reflect God's glory, then... Uh, humanity is uh, worthy of being treated with dignity. Every human is being worthy of being treated with dignity. Now, that gets difficult when we face someone who does uh, ho horrific things. And uh, to treat someone with dignity doesn't mean they don't face justice or judgment. It doesn't mean that right punishment shouldn't still happen. But there's ways we can do that in a way that dignify, that, that still holds dignity for humanity and still deals with uh, right justice and judgment. But that's the picture of reflecting. If the picture is that God called us to rule his world, then a important application for us is that if this is God's world, then he gets to make the rules. He gets to decide what is the right way and the wrong way to rule the world. And there has to be some sense of God's world dictates how it should be ruled. 
That's the picture that we're given of humanity. But of course, we know that's not a complete picture either. Because the reality is, uh, we often, humanity often makes terrible reflections of God's glory. In fact, the Bible uses the language, we've fallen short of the glory of God. And we make terrible rulers of God's world. And so there's not a complete picture there because that isn't what it looks like for us. And I think the biblical view, uh, it makes space for that and it acknowledges that. There's no place in the Bible where there's some kind of pretending like suffering doesn't happen, pretending like everything's the way it should be. The Bible is very clear. We have fallen short from God's glory. Things aren't the way they should be. And the writer here makes, points that out. He quotes this psalm in saying, all things are under human's authority. The very next verse says, verse 9, we have not seen all things put under their authority. There's acknowledgement here from the author that isn't actually how it feels. People will be put in charge to rule over this world, but we don't have complete control, do we? Things don't always go the way we want them we can't control everything there's a sense where we don't have that kind of rule that we would expect and once again we reflect on the genesis story the fall of humanity where there's a disordering of god's order you, you've probably heard this idea before the idea that god put uh, humans in charge of the creatures but in genesis 1 the way the story is told the evil one is depicted as a creature, as a serpent. And so there's a disordering of God's order. Rather than God uh, order, putting humans in charge of creatures, this creature comes in and undermines God, and the humans listen to the creature rather than God. There's a disordering of the order that results in disorder. It results in a brokenness in our world. The Bible makes space for suffering, recognizes the suffering, and, and even draws out, this is one of the key components to that suffering. One of the first answers to, to the question of why there's suffering in this world is we live in a broken world. The world itself is in disorder. And so that's the first answer to the question, question of suffering. The second answer we might have to the question of suffering is humans themselves are in disorder. We ourselves are not living the way we should. The world causes suffering, this broken, disordered world causes suffering, but humans also cause suffering to each other. And so we have this question, what, what, why doesn't God put an end to suffering? Well, for God to put an end to suffering, first of all, uh, he would have to take away some of our humans' free will to make decisions. Um, because our decisions cause suffering. But the second answer to why God has not yet put an end to suffering is he would have to remove sin, disobedience entirely. And removing sin, removing disobedience entirely would mean removing anyone who has not accepted the salvation in Jesus. And so that call to say, why doesn't God put an end to, sin, to the suffering, actually in part would say, because God's grace and kindness, he is giving people opportunity to turn to him. And so we see this picture of suffering. The third answer we get here to suffering is that Jesus meets us in our suffering. It's an incredibly profound thing of the message of the good news of Jesus, that he meets us in our suffering. And that is the sense that this author wants to draw Jesus out as the greater human. He says in verse 9, we have not seen all things put under human authority. Verse 10, what we do see is Jesus, is his words. Jesus is that answer to suffering. Jesus joins us in our suffering. I heard an interview this week. I don't know why it came up in my social media feed, but it was an interview with George W. Bush about playing golf. The question was, did you play golf as a president? He says, 
I didn't play golf as a president as long as we had soldiers at war. He said, I didn't think it was right for people to see me out on the golf course knowing that there we have other American soldiers off in another country. Now, that means he didn't play much golf during his presidency because they were at war almost the whole time. Um, there's something really nice about that, something that makes sense about that. Of course, Jesus doesn't just stop doing something he'd like to do because we are in a place of suffering. No, Jesus meets us in our suffering. Jesus doesn't stop playing golf. He joins us on the front line. And there's a lot of reasons why a general, a commander-in-chief, someone in charge might not join the soldiers on the front line. But Jesus doesn't have to worry about those things. He is the creator of all. He is in control of all things. And so he does meet us on the front line in our suffering. Jesus understands our suffering because he genuinely suffered. The times where we feel like we are misunderstood and people just don't get us. Jesus was called a liar. He was called a demon. He, he was vastly rejected by many people. When we feel rejected, when we feel lonely, Jesus was executed by his own people, by his own creation, by his own children. When we have moments where we see our children go through hurt and we feel the pain of our loved one in our life, God watched his own son suffer. When we have times where we physically suffer through illness or pain, Jesus suffered a great torture, great, hum great physical pain. When we face temptations time and time again that we feel like are just such a great burden to us, Jesus was tempted so greatly in the desert. We're told he was tempted so much, uh, he, was, he was so hungry that his temptation was to turn rocks into bread. I mean, that's how hungry... He was so hungry that he started thinking the rocks looked delicious. Jesus has suffered great temptation. Jesus joins us in our suffering. But he doesn't just join us in our suffering. His suffering is the cure to our condition. There's this... Hi, there's this U-shaped pattern in the, the letter to the Hebrews, um, a high to low to high picture. And that language is used in these, this chapter. Humans were created for glory. But our experience is far from God's glory because of the brokenness of humanity, because of sin. And there's a hope for future glory. We see that picture really clearly in Jesus. He is the one who has all glory. He is the glorious one who has been made low, is the language of the author. He's been made low, uh, and the very reason he's been made low is for us. And it's his suffering is the very mechanism by which he is glorified once again. Look at this. This is verse, verse 9. says, And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. His suffering is the very mechanism that takes him back to glory. His suffering is the cure to our condition. Suffering can be a useful thing in that sense. Um, I think once again of the illustration of the Olympians. Like there's not, there's not an Olympian out there that hasn't suffered, right? It's hard work. At very least, the suffering is getting up an early in the morning or the, the, the burn of the muscles after doing hard work out of, of running uh, to exhaustion. There's a suffering there. I mean, every Olympian can't have gotten to where they are without suffering. I mean, maybe the Hebrew, the, 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 maybe the Turkish shooter, maybe, maybe he's one who causes suffering as a mafia uh, boss. Everyone else, they've suffered in some sense. And in that sense, suffering is the mechanism, right? 
It's the mechanism to which got them to their place of glory. There's a similar picture here that Jesus' suffering is the mechanism that gets Jesus to glory. But also, God uses suffering for his glory in many ways. It's the fourth answer to understanding suffering. God uses suffering for good. Now, that's a difficult thing when you're in the thick of suffering. Uh, we can't always see how God might bring good out of our suffering. And there's certain suffering we'll never be able to wrap our head around how God brings good out of it. But it's clear God does use suffering for good. Um, he uses it. Suffering is good for, at times, our, our hearts, our humility. Suffering can uh, help grow us in humility. Suffering can draw us to dependence, dependence on others, but dependence on God, that when we suffer, uh, we are given a decision. Where do we run in our suffering? And of course, some will use suffering as the very thing that they use against God and reject God because of their suffering. But others will run to God in dependence of him in our suffering. And suffering at times, God uses, I think, as, as discipline to grow us more and more like him. Which, as difficult as suffering is, the greatest thing for us is to be united with God, to grow more and more like God. Just like Olympians, suffering can be good for us. Jesus' suffering, Jesus' humanity, is the very mechanism that leads him to glory. And he is the leader for us into glory. This is not just a high, low, high shape for Jesus. It's the same kind of picture for humanity. We were created for God's glory. We have fallen far short of God's glory. But Jesus leads us to an opportunity, if we follow him, into glory. Verse 9, God chose to bring many children into glory, and it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader. It is through Jesus' suffering that he leads us into glory. This is the biblical view we have of humanity, that we were created to reflect and to rule, and we are poor reflections of God's glory, and we're poor rulers of God's world. But the hope is, the promise in Jesus, is those that are united in him will once again perfectly reflect God's glory, and once again perfectly rule alongside Jesus. The author here uses the language, he will call us brothers and sisters. There is a future hope of a perfect rule alongside Jesus. It's the fifth answer to the question of suffering. It's the future hope that God has a plan for glory. I think this is one of those things that as we I mean, I think when we tackle the topic of suffering, it's always right to say in the depth of suffering, there is no answer to suffering that is emotionally adequate. Something can be true and not feel like an adequate answer to you at the time. Um, it's, the, it's the classic idea that when someone has an injury, someone loses an arm, you don't say, at least you still have your other arm. Right? That's not, that's not an appropriate response. It's a true statement, and there is some hope in that, but that's not the comfort in that moment. And the same thing's true as we think about these truths about God and suffering. Our perspective is so finite. Our perspective is so limited. Our time is such a small speck in the scheme of eternity. And the greatness of the suffering, no matter how great it is in our world, that suffering itself is only a speck in the perspective 
of eternity. And so God's view is far greater than ours. And if he is a good and loving God, there has to be good and loving reasons why suffering remains in this world. And, and we've tackled a few of them uh, this morning. But the ultimate hope is God's perspective is bigger. God's plan is greater. And God has a plan for future glory that is an eternal hope. Jesus is the greater human because, like all humans, he went from glory to suffering. And he looks forward to a day and leads us into a place where we might be glorified again. This is our hope in Jesus, and it's something we want to cling to. It's part of understanding uh, the biblical view of humanity and God's value for, for humanity, and therefore God's hope and plan he made for us. Uh, in two weeks' time, we mentioned already where we're, we're going to have uh, baptisms and confirmations. Baptism is one of those pictures of that for us. There's lots of images we get in baptism, um, the image of being washed clean, for example, but one of them is this image of death and resurrection. And there is a high, low, high picture that happens there. There's a humbling of ourselves, receiving God's, Jesus' death on us. We receive that death and we die to ourselves and rise again to new life in him. And I, I want to say, you know, as we head into that two weeks' time, if that's something you would like to do, if you've never been baptised, you want to talk to me about baptism, uh, I would say, because it's two weeks away, today's, you really need to talk to me today. Don't leave it any later than today if you would like to talk about baptism. And in that process, there's a declaration of allegiance to him. In that process, there's an act of saying, I accept this on myself, I want to receive I have received and I declare my allegiance to Jesus and I want to be baptised in doing that. And that is something that, even outside of that, just as followers of Jesus, we are called to do. That we receive, he leads us into his glory. But we want to declare that allegiance to him and be united with him in our suffering, in our lives, in our seeking to obey him as we look forward to glory with him. Let me pray. Lord God, we thank you that you cherish so greatly your creation in humanity, that you gifted us uh, so incredibly in your image uh, to be your image bearers. And we want to treat humanity with the right dignity it deserves. We know often we face the limitations of our mortality. We feel the brokenness of our world we feel the brokenness of ourselves. We thank you that you came, lowered yourself, met us in our, in our suffering, and that you lead us out through your suffering into your glory. Amen. We're going to stand and sing together again. Um, and as we do, you will notice kids trickling in. So be on the lookout for your little one. i
Though that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all.
service, but all of those beautiful conversations that you started at the beginning of the service get to continue now. We're going to have morning tea out in the sun, so we would love you to stick around. Um, and if you haven't met someone, you see someone you haven't seen before, make sure you say hello, and we will see you next week.